Thanks, sir. Oh, I'll redo that. We'll go ahead and call the order of the November 5th, 2020 Land Use and Natural Resource Committee meeting. Thank you all for joining us here today. <clears throat> I'd like to go ahead and start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. If everybody would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic in which is one nation. Under God, uh, indivisible, in this indivisible. Way. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Lynette, I think you've got some announcements and then maybe right into roll call. Yes, thank you. As you probably heard the system announced, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our website and live streamed. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and, and, sorry, any members participating by telephone or members of the public by telephone, you can press star nine to make a public comment. And board members, if you'd like to comment throughout the meeting, please press the raise hand feature in the system. Uh, Director Conant for Flores. Yes. Thank you. Frost. Here. Jankovitz. Absent Kennedy. Here. New. Here. Onderko. Absent West. Here. Vice Chair Gallardo. Here. Vice Chair Tixa. Here. Here. And Chair Spokley. I am here as well. Thank you very much, Lynette. <clears throat> um, next on our agenda is public communications. Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak to this committee? Chair Spokely, I don't have any public comment. Excellent. Moving right along, we'll jump right into our first action item. That is the approval of the minutes from October 1st, 2020. Committee meeting. I'll move approval. Frost. New seconds. Gialdo, motion, new second. Any conversation, comments on the minutes? Lynette, if you'd please call roll. Yes, thank you. Director Conant? Yes. Frost? Aye. Jankovitz? Yes. Thank you. Kennedy? Aye. New? Yes. Onderko? Uh, absent still? West? Yes. Vice Chair Gallardo? Vice Chair Gallardo, could you indicate your vote? Okay, I'll come back to you. Vice Chair Tixa? Yes. Chair Spokley? Yes. And coming back to Vice Chair Gallardo, if you're there, can you indicate your vote, please? Okay, I'll mark her as absent for that item. Thank you, the motion carries. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll uh, move on our agenda down to informational items. Item number two, update on rural Main Street technical assistant program. Mr. Chu, you're going to take that one for us? That's me. So I've uh, been before you be, uh, to update you on the rural Main Street technical assistance program. That's a grant that SACOG got. Um, from Caltrans uh, to provide technical assistance to uh, smaller communities, rural communities to revitalize their main street. So I'm just gonna give you an update on what's been happening. Uh, the grant runs out, um, basically work, uh, most work will be done by the end of this year. So I just want to give you a reminder of uh, what's going on and then um, give you an update. So um, we uh, are working with 11 communities, providing them assistance through the form of uh, consultants. Um, in any sort of service that relates to planning and revitalizations of main streets for rural communities. Uh, we've got 11 communities that we're working with. And uh, I guess I would categorize the services into kind of three different categories, um, designs on main streets, public education, and then uh, dealing with COVID and business survival. So uh, for those communities that are working on um, main street design um, in the city of Colfax, uh, uh, the city had to adapt to uh, COVID, uh, particularly for the restaurants. So uh, they closed off putting just hay bales 
in some of the parking spots, and that's turned out to be enormously popular. Uh, the city realized that uh, they may be onto something and want to make that more of a permanent sort of opportunity, but they want to look at um, best practices and examples across the country. So they've asked uh, the consultant team uh, led by the local government commission to, to put a little uh, uh, information together about that, look at the technical aspects of it, bring in a, uh, a landscape architect to uh, consider dimensions and so forth. And then we'll be writing a workshop in the next couple of weeks to do that. And then that'll give them enough conceptual information to uh, look for later funds to do engineering and then ultimately construction for their main street, but uh, be a way to revitalize that uh, um, main street. And as they're finding in COVID, um, their demand for services, they just need the right environment in which to do that. In Ioton, um, they also have a main street that's looking for uh, ways to revitalize and the community uh, is looking for a number of different ideas, but they need more developed ideas than people just brainstorming them. So we uh, are working with a fourth year graduate, uh, fourth year uh, architecture design uh, class at the University of San Francisco. So they have 32 students uh, that are developing different plans that Main Street can look like. Um, and with that, uh, the city will consider all the options and then uh, with that package it up uh, for uh, later on looking for um, um, uh, funding to, to implement one of those, one of those concepts. Uh, so that has been very successful so far. The students have been outstanding in terms of research and coming up with very unique ideas. Um, so between them and, and we have a very engaged uh, community group that uh, has been coming to all the meetings. Uh, these are uh, two sessions of uh, four hours each, um, and we're going to do that four times throughout the course of the project. So the semester is coming to an end, and uh, um, the students will bring something forward to the city very shortly. In Meadow Vista, um, in Placer County, um, on Placer Hills Road, uh, they have an area that, a uh, commercial area, uh, and there's, uh, they're talking about some possible possibilities for different road improvements to make it safer, uh, more accessible. There's a school nearby. Um, and uh, we did a public workshop and got a really uh, good um, turnout. Uh, we also did a public survey with over 300 uh, um, commenters on that about what the future of Meadow Vista could look like. And, um, and then now we're working on a temporary installation or um, um, just a, a temporary possibility for something um, where uh, we could do some sort of road improvement. It could be improved crosswalks or um, uh, bike lanes, protected bike lanes, or um, any, any options that they want. Uh, so we're working on identifying one now. Because of COVID, we may not be able to install it to see how it works, but that's the intention is, is we hope to do that. Uh, we have to decide that here pretty soon before the, before the rainy weather uh, comes here. Um, but if not, they will have enough information on how to do it. Um, um, and uh, so in the next month or so, uh, that installation will either take place or they'll have the plans to how to do that. In Placerville in Upper Broadway, uh, which is not the main street, but is more of a residential area, uh, there's a commercial corridor there that just uh, is kind of disparate properties and it's a long corridor and it's been slowly losing in parts of it uh, contact with the rest of Placerville. It's not doing nearly as well as the downtown part. So we're looking for kind of uniform consistency of the landscaping and possibly a gateway. Uh, so we've done a workshop for that uh, and uh, giving the city some proposals on different treatments that it could use uh, going forward. In Yuba City on Bridge Street, uh, that's the street that will ultimately connect to the improved bridge. Um, that uh, uh, number of different alignments are looked at. Uh, this is looking at the land use and uh, different ways to make that viable, either from a residential or commercial standpoint. We're looking at uh, mercados, um, uh, which are uh, temporary uh, food installation opportunity pod areas, uh, and other ways that we can make the area both function from a traffic standpoint as well as kind of work with the community that lives in that immediate area. There's gonna be a lot of traffic volume in, in that area. Um, on the education categories uh, in the town of Loomis, uh, this, the town's got a general plan going on and they're also updating their housing elements. 
Uh, our consultants are doing educational series with them, uh, business improvement, uh, Main Street design, housing, a um, number of other things to tie into the general plan efforts. Uh, so it's kind of timed as, as the town is going through that. Uh, the main part of this is what are we gonna do about uh, particularly the Taylor Road commercial corridor area. Um, so the, those uh, workshops have been focusing on that. In Orangeville on um, Greenback Lane, um, we've been working with the chamber there and the county, and uh, we've done five workshops, uh, educational workshops on those very topics, housing, street design, uh, transportation, uh, business uh, development, uh, and um, to give them uh, um, some direction or uh, suggestions for what other practices are across the U.S. and uh, ideas for how they can revitalize and turn that into uh, potential grant opportunities for physical improvements. Uh, the last category is on kind of COVID and business improvements. Uh, so uh, the start of this program was before COVID and then as we started getting going, um, four communities said, hey, we really need to find ways to get our businesses through our, our downtown communities and need, need to find a way. So in Antelope, uh, we're working with the PBID there, the Business Improvement District uh, on uh, strategic planning and uh, ways that they can consider uh, long range um, development of that com uh, commercial corridor along Willerga Road. Uh, in Galt, uh, they have a marketplace that is um, uh, their flea market and their farmer's market. It's a big area, it's a big uh, driver, but over years it's uh, been declining for various reasons. It's kind of put a look, a required relook at uh, the future of that site, uh, something that the city has been wanting to do for quite some time. In uh, Live Oak, uh, they have a highway improvement program going on, physical um, improvements being built, um, and that's created a lot of havoc for businesses there. Uh, you throw on COVID and they're double whammied with that. So uh, we've been working with businesses, uh, a couple on specifically on uh, details about how they can um, better uh, make themselves visible, how to merchandise, how to connect to the street, um, things like that. Uh, and then finally in Mar Marysville, uh, we worked with the downtown businesses, uh, met weekly for a couple of months uh, to develop a uh, COVID playbook and to talk about all the different strategies that our consultant Michelle Reeves has seen across the country about what small communities are doing to survive, um, not just COVID, but just general, uh, how do you bring business back into a downtown and what individual business do. So your attachment, that's part of the staff report, uh, is uh, that uh, report, the COVID playbook for Marysville. It's applicable anywhere um, and the strategy isn't just for COVID, but for any downtown on things that they can do to pull together to, to, um, to last through uh, and to help revitalize a corridor. Uh, so with that, um, uh, again, uh, the grant will be wrapping up um, and uh, we've got a bit of more work to do in the next two months, but uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, where the grant is going. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Greg, for that presentation. I'll open it up to the director. Does anybody have any questions for Greg on this item? Director Frost. Oh, the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to thank uh, Greg Chu and all the SACOG staff for all that you've done to uh, with the work that you've done in, in Orangeville and Antelope. Um, it, you you were you and and all the folks that participated i know i wasn't there for every single meeting but you were a huge inspiration to the community and they're working really hard um hoping to get something so um i i just wanted to thank you for everything you did a pleasure it's been a real delight working with both of those communities uh, they're very engaged in and very concerned about what happens and uh, they want to be, um, you know, they want to, they want to learn about how to do that. Oh yeah. They're, they're smart. And they you actually, they're trying to figure out how they can give you what you want so they can get what they want. So it's all good. Um, is how many, uh, the grant, 
when will we know about the grant and will this be a, um, I'm trying to remember how many grants will be offered up or. Uh, you're referring to uh, uh, in Orangevale, uh, if uh, the county wants to go after a community design grant, that's part of our uh, regional funding program. Um, so that'll be, uh, the guidelines will be released fairly soon. Uh, and then the application will be due in mid January. Uh, and then it'll be going, uh, the recommendations will be going to the SACOG board in, in spring, in uh, probably April. Okay, thanks. Any other directors have questions for Greg? Greg, I've got a couple of quick questions and, and um, <clears throat> You know, you've got a list of, of communities that are participating um, in, in this round. Is, is this a reoccurring, this money we got from Caltrans, is this, is this something that happens annually or every couple of years, or is this a one-off kind of an opportunity? Uh, it's not, it's more of a one-off, but every uh, year, every two years, Caltrans does uh, do a call for projects of application competitive process that we compete around the state. So uh, as there are opportunities, uh, there's one coming up again, uh, and we've been discussing that at SACOG about what we'll be going after. So it's uh, the Caltrans grant programs recurring, whether or not we get the funds and whether or not we can get the funds for this particular activity. Uh, is uh, we would be coming back to the board if, if we do that. And, and I, I, I know the answer to this, but I'll just ask anyway, the, the, the packet is um, the attachment um, that you provided on this item. We're okay to share that with our constituents and, and staff as an example of here's what a lot of the stuff I went through it, a lot of the stuff I think we're, we're all kind of naturally doing in our communities. But it was nice to see, you know, a, a formal package put together by the consultants that were, were help, helping out Marysville. I think was a package. So <clears throat> it was it was nice to kind of thumb through that. Yeah, we made it um, we made it catered to to Marysville, but it's a universal document. It works in a lot of small communities. It works in a lot of communities. Period, um, and it just documents practices. Many of them you intuitively would do, but uh, there's other practices out there that are a little bit more cutting edge. So um, our consultant took the best of what she's seen across the country that would apply to Marysville, but it, again, it applies throughout the whole region. Yeah, I will say on the, on the COVID front, as far as outdoor dining and, and utilizing, you know, public rights of way in, in unique ways is uh, something that I know all of us, you know, all of us who are uh, electeds are, are doing some program or another to try to try to provide the seating that's so desperately needed is, is worse. Potentially going to be sliding backwards. Some of our, some of our member jurisdictions are going to be sliding backwards um, and we're heading into winter months. It's, it's going to be um, a huge challenge, but um, anyway, I guess that's commentary. Um, let's see, Lynette, do we have anybody um, from the public that wanted to make any comments on this informational item? No, no comments from the public. Great. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for your presentation. Greatly appreciate it. With that, we'll move on to item number three, which is our commercial corridor task force, task force toolkit review. And I think Ms. Hargrove has this item. Yep, thanks. Just getting set up here. Okay, this item um, is a preview of the draft toolkit that we are working on aimed at commercial corridor revitalization. Um, I'll be co-presenting with Dov Caden today on this item. If you're not able to see the screen, I am using presentation number one from the agenda materials that are posted on SACOG's website. Also, just a quick note, I'll be skipping a couple of the slides today just to help with the time since we do have a two-part presentation. Um, the committee will recall that our second year of Civic Lab was com completed in 2019 and that was focused on commercial corridors. Through that program, we really began to just scratch the surface of the many multifaceted challenges that our older commercial corridors are facing around the region. 
Following that work, Director Sander, who was board chair at the time, wanted to continue that work with a task force made up of public and private agencies to really tackle some of these bigger issues. And at your last meeting, you heard a little about the task force um, and their work from the staff lead, Monica Hernandez, and also from Director Sander. That task force has met throughout this year and the draft toolkit that I'll get into in just a second is really um, based on those discussions from that task force. Uh, the toolkit is aimed to be uh, for policymakers and will offer strategies for how to overcome some of the challenges for revitalizing these corridors. Uh, and by these corridors, we do mean our traditional commercial corridors like Watt Avenue and Folsom Boulevard, but we also do mean some of the smaller corridors like Greg was just talking about um, and some traditional main streets, smaller communities. I think just as Greg's toolkits have many of the barriers that are identified and the strategies that we have um, could be applicable in a wide variety of places. But I also do wanna be upfront that uh, the toolkit certainly does not address all the challenges facing commercial corridor revitalization. It's targeted at those challenges that have risen to the top in the discussions at the task force and um, those that local agencies do have some influence over. But there isn't going to be a one size fits all approach. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I would even characterize these as best practices, all of them. They are all tools in a toolbox and many of the strategies could potentially are, are going to be somewhat corridor and context sensitive. So it will require local jurisdictions and communities to consider which of the tools would be most effective in their communities and for their goals. Um, the first meeting of the task force was focused on a discussion of the many barriers to corridor revitalization and really infill development overall. Much of this has been uh, informed through the Civic Lab Year 2 work, but also through our work on the Green Means Go strategy. The task force had great discussions about many of these challenges, as well as some of the solutions that the toolkit gets into. So the toolkit, again, really is a combination of the task force discussions and building on some of our existing resources and research. Today, rather than review all of the strategies, I'll highlight a few from each of these topic areas, um, but the full toolkit in draft form was provided to you with the staff report today um, as attachment A. We are taking a, a slightly more polished uh, designed version of that to the task force next week to get their final review and input, but the tools and strategies um, as written are what you have in your attachment today. So starting first with some infrastructure tools and strategies. First on the list, um, and they're not in any particular order, but the one I'll highlight today is relevant to your next agenda item of Green Means Go. Um, this strategy is to analyze, identify, and quantify all of the infrastructure needs. Sometimes in planning, we're really focused on the land uses and the above ground needs and the things that we can see, but Equally important is um, understanding what's needed below ground to support the infill, increased infill development on the corridor. This can help prioritize needed upgrades, but also helps create a predictable, uh, a more predictable environment and can help establish fees. Um, again, this is a key theme coming out of our green means go and green zone work. Next, I'll talk a little bit about some of the process improvements. The first few strategies listed here are about removing some of the process, like moving to buy right approvals for housing developments that are consistent with your zoning. Um, you had a presentation and discussion about that earlier this year with DOV. Coordinating with outside agencies and special districts um, can help bring, again, that certainty and consistency to the process for developers. Again, that's a challenge we really uncovered in the Green Means Go um, strategy and hope to continue exploring further next year. The last strategy from this regulatory bucket I'll touch on quickly is about reducing or removing parking minimums. I know this committee has heard a lot about that um, throughout the year and we've talked about it before, so I won't spend a lot of time, but just that we know um, our zoning code can sometimes have unintended 
barriers, um, lot coverage requirements, setback requirements, parking requirements can sometimes um, unintentionally make a smaller infill parcel not developable or not able to pencil a project. Uh, moving into some of the strategies for reducing um, costs and fees. If we wanna increase development, oh, oh sorry, uh, reducing costs and fees. Again, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of these, but the toolkit does have a full discussion on all of them. But we know if we wanna increase infill development, particularly housing, um, one consideration could be to change the fee structure from per unit to per square foot. This was actually brought to light in the task force by one of our private developers who is participating in that task force group. She was really able to use analysis from one of her projects to demonstrate how we could better incentivize infill housing, particularly multi-unit developments if the per unit fees are not the same as the fees for a single family home. Also related to fees, um, a consideration might be to structure fees by location or pilot fee reductions in the corridor to really try to incentivize um, growth happening in that area. But even if you can't reduce fees, um, a lot of what we heard about green and green means go is transparency about what the fees are, as well as any conditions of approval is still um, important and helpful to reducing the risk to developers coming into these areas. The task force discussed a lot about how housing plays a large role in corridor revitalization. So many of the solutions are actually around how to get more housing in and also around the corridor to essentially get more people on the corridor. One of these strategies is to consider the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the corridor and what can be done to increase the housing density in these neighborhoods. Um, allowing and encouraging accessory dwelling units, missing middle products like fourplexes, um, even if these are single family neighborhoods can increase activity on the corridor by increasing the housing and the households that are nearby. Additionally, in corridors that have access um, that have access to transit and transit that's frequent. It's um, important to support transit-oriented development and specifically the higher densities, um, allowing those higher densities to be in close proximity to those transit stations. And the last strategy I'll touch on today is about finding ways to activate the vacant spaces. A lot of what Greg was just talking about too, um, but we know these older commercial corridors um, and smaller downtowns, there can be, um, you have these vacant lots or parking lots and finding ways to activate those for a temporary use. Um, and then making sure your policies and your codes actually allow for that is an important component, right? Because it doesn't take a lot to activate these spaces. Sometimes it's just lights or paint um, or food truck or something, but oftentimes the, the codes or the process isn't in place for it. And that's, that's the last strategy that I'll touch on today. This was a very brief, quick overview of the strategies you'll find in the toolkit that relate to infrastructure, fees, process, housing. Um, of course, we hope that many of these strategies are useful to help with corridor revitalization and that they spur investment and development in these areas. But with that then comes a risk of displacing existing residents and or existing businesses. And because of that, the last meeting of the task force, they talked a lot about displacement. So that is an important piece of the toolkit as well. So I'd like to turn it over to Dov to introduce that topic and some of the strategies of, um, around um, reducing displacement risk. And then we would be both happy to take any questions or comments from the committee. Dov, do you wanna? Sure, thanks, Jen. So as we work to transform these older commercial corridors, it's it's so important that we ensure that we're investing in these places, yes, but we do so without displacing the existing residents and the businesses that are already there. And so to that end, we do have a section in the toolkit that's devoted to reducing displacement. Um, before I jump into some of the policies, um, just a little bit of level setting on what we mean when we say these terms, because the, the definitions do tend to vary depending on who you talk to. So. 
gentrification, uh, when we say that, we're generally referring to, to a process of neighborhood change. We're talking about neighbors that are seeing increasing land values and influx of, of higher income residents, as well as um, changes to the racial composition of the neighborhood as well. And in many cases, gentrification can lead to um, displacement, which can be generally thought of as existing residents and businesses uh, being forced to leave. And, and that can happen directly through evictions or uh, more commonly by just being priced out, right? As rents increase beyond a residence or a business's ability to pay. Displacement has a whole suite of negative consequences that you know, can push families further away from their jobs, from their services, from their social networks, um, and in extreme cases can result in homelessness as well. Jen, can you turn the slide for me? Um, so displacement can have different causes. In, in many cases, it's, it's actually a symptom of a, a larger scarcity problem in which the sort of high demand neighborhoods are attracting people and businesses, but aren't actually um, building uh, new, new floor area or, or units for them for whatever reason. So um, those people in that capital don't disappear, right? They spill over into the, the sort of cheaper neighborhoods that may be adjacent um, and, and they push people out. And then I think the more traditional mechanism that, that most folks are familiar with is when a, a neighborhood sees new investment, be it uh, public or private, and, and that investment makes a neighborhood nicer demand goes up, land values go up, rents go up, and then people get pushed out. If we could turn the slide again. Like I mentioned, we, we do have a, a suite of tools and strategies in the toolkit that are explicitly aimed at reducing displacement. This section, like the rest of the policies in this toolkit, is an effort just to create a menu of potential actions to address the, the many different challenges that are um, related to this topic. And it's all based on discussion that we had at the task force. Uh, but to be clear, this is not an exhaustive list of tools, and um, certainly not all the tools will work everywhere. It'll be context specific. So the outline divides up the potential tools and strategies into six buckets. I'm going to briefly touch on each bucket and highlight um, an example policy from a few of them. We call that first bucket natural affordability, but this is really about all of the, the different policies that Jen uh, discussed earlier that, that make it easier and cheaper to build infill multifamily housing. Making it easier to, to build smaller, more, more naturally attainable multifamily actually does ease pressure on existing units and can help to stem displacement pressures. Um, particularly if you can do this in the super high demand, high opportunity neighborhoods that historically haven't seen a whole lot of new building. The second bucket is about building capital A affordable housing through subsidy. This is incredibly important because there will always be a, a segment of the population for which the new housing, even that smaller multifamily housing that we're talking about is not gonna be affordable for. And so uh, many of the policies actually in the natural affordability bucket make it easier to actually build subsidized affordable housing. But ultimately this, this category is about finding the, the money to actually subsidize those lower rents on the project. Particularly challenging issue here in California where it's um, exceedingly difficult for local governments to, to raise revenue. So many jurisdictions will look to things like um, impact fees, um, inclusionary zoning ordinances, which are both sometimes politically popular and can be um, effective, but uh, sometimes also raise concerns about increasing the price of the, the non-subsidized units. So one interesting strategy that's in the toolkit for raising local money for affordable housing is a progressive real estate transfer fee, which is essentially a, a property value-based um, fee that's assessed when you sell a, a single family home. All jurisdictions in our region already do this, but in a fairly minimal way and in a flat way. So a, a progressive Transfer tax fee might be a, a creative way to fund affordable housing in um, perhaps a more equitable way than something like a sales tax or um, taxing new development like an impact fee. Third is tenant protections, which is um, a critical one to, to ensure that the most vulnerable renters are, are stabilized and supported as our communities do inevitably change. One of the, the key tenant protections, especially right now during the pandemic, for, for keeping people in their homes is just cause eviction policies. 
And this is basically just a catch-all phrase for policies that, that prevent landlords from evicting tenants unless there is a, a just cause, like violating the lease, for example. Many of the, the basic protections uh, were, were actually guaranteed statewide last year by uh, Bill AB, AB uh, 1482, but there, there were a variety of exemptions in that bill. So for example, the, the just cause provisions only applied to homes that were over 15 years old. They also didn't apply to single family rentals, which actually make up a, a decent amount of the Sacramento region's rental stock. So local governments can, can plug that hole through a local just cause eviction ordinance. Fourth is commercial uh, displacement prevention, which is about policies and strategies that um, build capacity from within and really support the existing businesses on these corridors so that when we do revitalize, we're uh, again, not displacing the businesses that are already there. And the fifth bucket is, is preservation, which is about trying to track and preserve affordable housing whose um, affordability term is, is set to expire. Local governments can enact affordable housing preservation policies that require owners of regulated uh, rental housing to follow fairly specific procedures in advance of that affordability period expiring. And then the final bucket is public processes and developing a baseline. And this one is really aimed at, at building greater local knowledge, um, accountability, transparency into our local land use and development decision making. One of the things that we talked about with the task force was starting any revitalization effort off with an assessment of the community just to better understand who lives in the area, what businesses are, are currently operating, you know, what their, their biggest needs are. We also talked about continuing to um, communicate to the public how most effectively they can participate in the planning process. So those are some of the policies and strategies we've identified that are out there. Uh, we recognize that these policies, along with the ones that Jennifer spoke about, do not address all the challenges facing commercial corridor revitalization. These are just the actions that have sort of stood out in, in our discussions with the task force and those that we know that local agencies can have some influence over. As Jen mentioned, this is going to be going to the task force next week for final input and then um, Lunar or the board will see it again in December. Uh, with that, Jen and I are happy to take any, any questions or comments you might have. Thank you, Jennifer and Goff, for those for the presentations. <clears throat> I'll open it up to directors. Do any of our directors have questions for Dov or Jennifer on this item? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do. Patrick Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the and I brought this up at our own board meeting last Tuesday. Um, with ADUs, I'm finding that uh, the biggest hurdle seems to be that you can't get financing for them. Have we looked at uh, maybe uh, going over to the Capitol and, and sponsoring a piece of legislation that would help us with that or any other strategy? Because right now it's really tough to get ADUs built with no financing. I can take that one. Um, yes, that's a, a great question. And the financing piece is, is something that has been a challenge. I think the for a while, the low-hanging fruit was sort of the local regulatory process, and now that there has been such movement on that, the financing piece has sort of become one of the, the bigger bottlenecks. Um, it is something that we certainly have talked about a good amount. Um, we actually have a someone from Umqua Bank um, uh, who kind of specializes in ADU financing and creative lending products who's speaking to our um, to our housing planners at an upcoming um, Civic Lab housing series meeting. So we'll be interested to see what, um, what she has to say, uh, but it's, it's certainly a challenge and it's one that uh, we'd like to work on. As for legislation, there, there actually was, um, I, I can't speak to the specifics on it, but there was a piece of legislation that actually did pass the legislature this year, but then was not signed by the governor related to um, uh, creating sort of a, a statewide loan financing program specifically for ADUs. Um, I think there was a concern about um, the, the credit rating of, of the state and what it would, the impacts to our credit. Um, but that's something that we can certainly explore next year. And we can talk to uh, Christina, our, our um, policy manager on that. And, and the, the, another question, uh, you know, similar is with the progressive um, uh, transfer fee scheme, um, you know, that's been before the legislature a couple of times. And 
uh, the the state realtors, while the local realtors actually finally supported it in Sacramento, the state realtors um, fought it and it was eventually defeated. Is 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 there um, any movement at the Capitol that uh, we're going to see that? Because I think that's something that would be um, better as a statewide policy than a jurisdiction by jurisdiction. I, I can't speak to to what the the state has been doing on that. I do know most most jurisdictions across the state currently have um, a point eleven percent of sales price transfer fee, and then some jurisdictions have, as you noted, um, gone above that. I think actually just a, a few days ago, San Francisco you know, doubled their transfer tax fee for um, homes that were uh, over ten million dollars of sales. Obviously, a very different. Uh, situation in San Francisco, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the the state is doing. I do know that there's been probably five to ten jurisdictions across the state who have explored this uh, at the local level, though. Okay, thank you. I, I know that that ten million dollar threshold really kills me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Director Kennedy. Anybody else have questions for Gov and Jennifer? Uh, I've, I've got a couple of quick questions and, and, and it's kind of related to the impact fee component in the toolkit. Um, you know, all of our jurisdictions have, you know, have fee programs that have been developed um, and, and they um, are updated quite often on, on occasion. Uh, the the impact fees will actually kind of be right-sized and brought down, but that's definitely a rarity. Most, most of the time there's annual increases that are applied uh, to these fee programs and they go up and up and up and up and up. Um, I think I saw somewhere in this toolkit or maybe it was a staff report that a single family residential house could have upwards of $80,000 in impact fees assessed uh, for for that single unit, um, <clears throat> with 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 these fee programs, um, the the costs for um, for say a multifamily unit or duplex unit, um, that's an area where we could really see some. Um, valuable incentives for folks to start building these products. Um, and, and I'll read the, through this in more detail, but it, uh, it's certainly an area that I deal with with my clients in my day job all day long um, because, because of those, in some jurisdictions, quite, quite high impact fees are assessed. And there doesn't seem to be a big break for the housing product type that is for medium or lower income classifications. And that I think is a piece that's missing from all of our jurisdictions. Um, and I don't have the answers on how we get there, but I, I, I think that's an important part of what, what we all need to be thinking about. Uh, things like waiving the parking requirements, that's certainly helpful. Um, the the um, ADU Financing thing, that's another good point that Director Kennedy brought up. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, we start talking about the commercial corridors and how can we revitalize them. And we circle back around and we're having a lot of conversation about housing and housing costs and densification and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's good. I like the work that the committee's put together here. I think, um, I think there's a lot of very useful information in here um, some of it I'm not wild about, which is, you know, ordinancing, you know, things to happen a certain way, um, kind of isn't my style, but I, I see where it might have some benefit. Um, anyway, thank you both for the presentation. I do appreciate it. Any final questions for this item? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to item number four, green zone nominations for green means go. Jennifer, it looks like you're on again. 
Yep, that's me again. Um, this item actually is a good follow-up to that discussion and, and good tee up for me, Director, Director Spokely, thanks. <laughs> um, as you all know, Green Means Go is our primary strategy for achieving our greenhouse gas emission reduction target for the MTPSCS, but it's also our strategy, our one of our primary strategies for achieving many of our shared regional goals, such as connecting communities, fostering vibrant places for us, all of our residents to live, play, and work, and also regional prosperity. Green Means Go is a place-based strategy centered on supporting and accelerating infill development, and in these infill areas, supporting transportation options that will help reduce vehicle travel. And the places that we're targeting with the place-based investment strategy are what we're calling green zones. Back in August, with the re recommendation from this committee, the board adopted a framework for establishing green zones. And since then, for the last two months, we've been in an open nomination period where we asked cities and counties to take the lead in nominating green zones to SACOG. Again, these are infill places where um, you as a local jurisdiction have plans or policies to support increased infill development. A locally led um, nomination period just ended last week on Friday, um, October 30th. So we're still very much um, reviewing all these and, and taking them in and beginning to follow up with local agency staff as needed. But as James mentioned, James mentioned at the onset of the meeting, we did get more than 20 jurisdictions nominating green zones. So really great participation and collaboration. A big thank you to all of you and to your staff. We know um, a lot went into these nominations. Um, we know it was, I hope it wasn't a lot of work, but we just know it is additional work. And so we very much appreciate it. Um, a local resolution is required. And so many of you might have seen your jurisdiction's nominations coming through your council or board agendas already. And if not, I know many are still coming forward this month and even into early December. So until those work their way through, we will consider all the nominations pending that local approval. But our intent is that um, we complete our follow-ups, those resolutions make their way through your local processes by December, and then I'll be back at your December committee meeting to request that this committee consider recommending that the full board adopt these regional green zones at their December board meeting. Um, today's just an info item to remind you of the process and alert you to the action that we'll be requesting of you next month. And uh, before I hand it back to the chair, I do want to touch on one last thing, which is very quickly, um, so what would, what's next for green zones? First, um, a reminder that we have been and continue to lobby for state funding to support Green Means Go. And we think that having these green zones in place will really help with that effort. Second, having the green zones and the information that we've gathered from all of your staff really will allow us to do more analysis and really gain a better understanding of the needs in these areas. And that can help us um, further hone the Green Means Go strategy, but also connect efforts like the Commercial Corridor Task Force that Dov and I just presented on or the Rural Main Streets that Greg presented on with these green zones. And then last, teeing up the next agenda item just a bit, we do have some REAP funding set aside for housing planning work in these green zones. So while we don't have funding for the overall Green Means Go program yet, this committee has been forward planning and really supportive of using a portion of that one-time REAP funding to support Green Means Go and planning work in these green zones. So that's the um, brief update today. We'll be looking for an action from you next month, um, but happy to answer any questions on green zones or the process that we've just gone through as well. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Do any of the directors have questions for Jennifer on green zones? I'll just give a quick shout out to you, Jennifer and James for helping um, John and in our small little city get get something in. It wasn't the prettiest thing, but 
Um, it sounds like we're getting a little support from SACOG's GIS group, which I'd greatly appreciate. Um, I didn't have time myself to do the map here in my office, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys um, were able to kind of help us along. So we really do appreciate it. Thank you. And, and Chair Spokely, I just, if I could, I just, I do want to say, and I'm just going to reiterate really what, what Jennifer just presented. Uh, we're so appreciative of all of your, of all of your staff taking time to put this together. Um, we know it's not nothing. And um, literally, we believe this is sort of putting us on the map, like literally on the map, the, the actual map of the region about where we want to focus and target a lot of our effort to make um, infill and economic revitalization and commercial corridors actually happen. Um, and I, I also, I just want to reflect for all of you, I think this is a great example of how, as a region, we can take state goals, which are around housing and arena and climate and carbon reduction, a regional plan and a framework, and even the, our regional staff as the resource, and really local implementation, right? It is the it's the layered cake approach, but really driven from driven from all of you, driven from the local level. Um, so, I, I I I just think that should not be lost on us. That this is this is us basically sort of setting the and you all in your local jurisdiction saying, hey, yeah, you know, if you want to talk about new housing and we can talk about economic, this is this is where in our jurisdiction it makes the most sense, and we come in behind you and say, hey, look, that's actually also where in the future, we'll have less driving and less CO2 emissions, um, and we can help on that. So maybe that's obvious to all of you, but I think it's really important as you as you as you you, you wind this process down. It's really just a one step in this in this road to really developing our again our regional strategy to revitalize a lot of our existing communities. Thank you very much for that, James. Um, couldn't agree more. One last time, any, any other questions from our directors on this informational item? All righty, hearing none, we will move on to Sorry. the next item. Do you here? Yeah. This is Director Tito, sorry. I'm pretty good at the restaurant, kind of got, uh, had, to, had to go somewhere really quick, but I have a qu really quick uh, question. Yeah, please, uh, go ahead, Director Tito. So uh, my question is, in the future, are we going to be con continuing um, this funding or nominations in the future for the Green Means Go? Um, like, is there going to be funding planned yearly for this? Or are we just going to be waiting for state funding for this project? Set. Maybe I'll. So, oh, that's to James. I'm looking yeah. at Jennifer on the screen. <laughs> okay, um, sorry. No, no, it's good. Um, it's a great question. I mean, I think our intent, and Jennifer can kick me virtually under the virtual table here. Our our intent is for this to be iterative, right? So, so this is the first. This is kind of the first. Uh, actually, many good jurisdictions put in what we call pre-applications about eighteen months ago. Now these are more formal, and are you know just like the economy and your land use economics and housing markets. This is going to change over time, right? So. We, we really want to make, but we don't want to update them every few months because your staff will kill us. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a process here where we kind of, where, where we keep on updating it. And I know we've, um, and rightly so, uh, talked a lot about getting state, getting the state to help us basically, right? What, what do we need? We need something to make up for the loss of redevelopment. We, we need some tools and some financing and some funding. So, so be patient on that. That's a long game given the, ec the economy and the state budget. I'll also tell you though, back to the sort of the, the bottom up layer cake, I think as a region, and many of you all sit on these kinds of other boards and commissions, we need to figure out how do we get all of our local and regional agencies to align incentives. So, so we're actually making it easy for you to get that economic development and housing in, this, in, the, in the green zones. And we've had some great conversations with Regional Water Authority, SAC Suburban, Regional SAN, SMUD. Um, there's a lot, I think, that more that we could do just, just locally and regionally, right, to align all of these various uh, agencies uh, it, with a plan. That, that's the goal, uh, in addition to getting state support. So, so stay tuned on that. I know the task force 
and Chair Sander of the task force has had a lot of interest in that topic. Um, I don't want to overpromise, but I do think there's, there's, my point is, I think there's things we can do locally and regionally in addition to trying to get the state to help us uh, with some funding. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number five. Me again. <laughs> yes, it is you again. <laughs> Last item from me today, promise. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm going to start a presentation here as well. Get this going. And if um, this is presentation number two, if you're not able to see the screen, and you can find that on SACOG's website. Um, for this item, I'll, I'll provide a, a quick update on REAP, but really want to focus on the competitive grant program that we will be funding with REAP. As a reminder, the REAP program is one-time funding coming to SACOG through HCD, the State Department of Housing and Community Development for housing planning activities in our region. So to start, um, here's a reminder of the guiding principles that we set for REAP, for the overall REAP program. Uh, the REAP program itself at the state level has the primary goal of accelerating and increasing housing. And the additional lenses we've added um, is a focus on infill, a focus on more housing choice, and of course, leveraging Green Means Go, as we just talked about. Back in March, the board adopted a framework for how to utilize the first 25% of the REAP funds and then followed that with an action in June to adopt a framework for how we spend the remaining 75%. <clears throat> So together, um, this slide represents the adopted plan for how we will utilize the full $6.7 million coming to SACOG. So I'll use the slide to give a quick update on the work to date, and then I'll present on some of the details for, um, for the draft framework for the competitive program that we would really like to discuss with the committee today. Um, SACOG received the first 25% of funds from HCD. Um, as shown here, we've dedicated up to $600,000 to our Civic Lab Year 2 teams for housing-related um, activities on their commercial corridors. We also dedicated between $10,000 and $200,000 to each jurisdiction to help pay for housing element updates. Those allocations were based on the RENA share of units that each agency received in the RENA process. Um, both of these are moving forward, meaning that um, SACOG staff have been in contact with all local agency staff um, for a while, getting scopes of work, getting those MOUs in place so that we can start getting those funds out to the cities and counties. And then I'm happy to report that just yesterday, we submitted our application to HCD for the remaining 75% of funds. Um, which is shown here, we're, we're using some of that to run our mini civic lab series that's focused on housing. We also have dedicated about 2.8 million to non-competitive grants, and then the 1.7 million to a competitive grant program targeting those green zones. Um, in anticipation of a uh, award letter from HCD on our remaining funds, we are getting started thinking about these two grant programs. The board adopted REAP framework from June, outlined the details for the non-competitive funding that is shown here on the left. Um, this included a um, set grant amount allocated to each city and county based on RENA. This um, allocation ranges from $40,000 to $600,000 per jurisdiction. The application process is intended to be a, just a very simple letter to say COG outlining how the funds would be used so that we can uh, ensure that it's consistent with state requirements for the REAP dollars. Uh, the REAP framework from June outlined eligible activities for this non-competitive grant program. And it really is a, a pretty wide range of activities. So long as there's a housing nexus, we will consider it. The adopted framework from June did not provide the same level of details on the competitive grant program that you see here on the right. It allocated the funds and committed to using the funds in green zones, but um, we made the commitment to come back to this committee with many of the details that I'll be going over today, um, proposing uh, for this competitive program. Uh, 
So I'll, I'll dive into those in just a minute, but I did want to highlight these two programs um, side by side here and point out we are thinking of having the same application period for both the non-competitive and the competitive grant, hoping that this isn't a burden on agencies, but that it helps them think about um, how they want to be using their non-competitive funds and what they might apply for on the competitive side and any potential leveraging opportunities there as well. So attachment A in your staff report is a first draft of a framework for this competitive grant program. Today, I'm, I would like to hear any feedback that the committee has on this. Um, this was also sent out to all local agency staff for review and we're requesting their input on it as well. Building off of the REAP framework and the Green Means Go strategy, the draft goals we've set for the program include increasing and or accelerating housing, supporting the green zones, reducing VMT, and supporting public engagement on any planning work that is awarded in these green zones. I'd like to highlight some of the information that uh, is from the draft framework, again, that you have in attachment A. Um, applications must be in green zones, pending the SACOG board adoption of those green zones in December, of course. Um, applicants must attend two of the four civic lab workshops that we're putting on. That was actually written into the June framework. Since we are holding that civic lab series right now to really try and help um, local agencies prepare for how they might um, utilize these two grants. But we, will, we are making recordings available if um, staff aren't able to attend two of the four uh, in real time. Projects that have the greatest potential to increase housing supply, such as specific plans, zoning code updates, fee changes, are what we would like to prioritize um, with this program. And so we are intending to really hone in on a, a slightly narrower list of eligible activities compared to what will be allowed in the non-competitive grants. All activities uh, must include an implementation component, like adopting a plan in some way, or you know, implementing the fee change or something like that. And that adoption or implementation requirement is actually one from the state for the larger REAP program itself. And then lastly, um, as you heard Dob and myself speak to in the earlier item today on uh, commercial corridor re revitalization, we know that investment in these green zones can have the potential to lead to displacement. So we would like to require some type of public engagement or displacement analysis for any of the projects that get awarded. Um, of course, exceptions can be made if that type of work has already been completed in the green zone. For the application process itself, we want to be as streamlined as possible. We definitely hear you, know, you and your staff about the time and effort required for grant applications. We are considering um, just a short list of mostly narrative-based questions. We are proposing to ask for some quantitative information about potential number of units or acres impacted but we would, um, whatever data we are requesting, SACOG will be able to assist in providing that for applicants. Um, the draft framework uh, here that you have in your staff report does not include this detail, but we are thinking that projects would be scored by a review panel of up to five people, likely two SACOG staff and up to three external partners. So again, today uh, we'd like to hear the committee's thoughts on this draft framework, and we'll be discussing it informally with your staff, as well as putting together a final framework for your consideration in December. If the committee moves the item in December, we would be requesting action from the board in December, which would then set this calendar in motion. Uh, this program is one piece of the overall community design funding round that uh, Greg Chu spoke about last month. So ideally, we're teeing up uh, funding recommendations from this program in June, which is uh, within a month of the project awards from the other components of the community design program. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, the consulting bench that we're putting together. 
We have an RFQ out right now for a wide range of housing related activities for REAP funding. Through the RFQ process, we'll be pre-qualifying a bench of consultants who can provide any number of the activities that you see here. SACOG will be using the consultants from the bench to provide the technical assistance that REAP is funding through the Civic Lab series. But we're really excited um, and hopeful because we think that this can make, we think the consultant bench, uh, we, we can make it accessible to local agencies for any REAP activities. So local agencies could use consultants from the bench for work that's utilizing their, their non-competitive REAP allocation or for any of those projects that are awarded through the competitive program. It's not a requirement that cities and counties use consultants from the bench, but we do see it as a way of streamlining the procurement process for those who want it. Additionally, the REAP funds are available on a reimbursement basis but that's a reimbursement from SACOG who has to get reimbursed from HCD. And for many local agencies that can mean carrying these consultant costs for months. And we know that that's a challenge for many of you. So we're exploring and really excited about the potential for SACOG to administer these funds on behalf of the local agencies. Again, where that would be the preference of the local agency, that that would allow a jurisdiction to scope a project, select a vendor from the bench, and then authorize SACOG to pay the vendor directly with the funding that was allocated to that jurisdiction through REAP. Um, of course, the jurisdiction still needs to be a, you know, a project manager, um, be the lead, approve invoices, but essentially would be passed directly to SACOG for payment. So some a three-way agreement in place, really. Again, we're hopeful that this can be worked out and that agencies that it would make it aid easier for many agencies to use some of these REAP funds, whether it be the non-competitive or the competitive. And with that, I'm happy to um, answer any questions about REAP, but um, again, no action today, but would love to hear any comments or feedback you have on this draft framework about the competitive program specifically. Jennifer, thank you very much for the presentation. I'll, I'll start this time. Just a quick question on what you were just talking about, the bench of consultants. That's Those would be paid for through successfully obtaining a grant by your local jurisdiction, right? And then we could look to the bench to pull the consultant we need for whatever the effort is. Is, is that the idea there? Yeah, so there's there'll be two ways, right? Each jurisdiction is being allocated a specific dollar amount through the non-competitive funds. And you could choose, you know, for your, for um, a jurisdiction, say they have $50,000 $50, being allocated to them. Um, you can choose from this bench and rather than taking the, you know, taking the $50,000 essentially, you work through this bench through task orders um, or scopes of work. And then SACOG will pay the consultant up to that dollar amount. The same sort of thing would apply if you're successful in getting one of the competitive grants um, rather than the reimbursement model that I was just talking about, just essentially cut out the middleman and have SACOG pay the consultant, but it's, it's, the, uh, it's the funds that are awarded to the jurisdiction, correct? So, so you just kind of touched on what I was trying to get to, but cutting out the middleman. So we wouldn't necessarily have to find funds to, to um, you know, out of our general fund or wherever we found funds to pay for these consultants and then seek reimbursements after the fact or after you get the milestones, you guys would pay them directly. Um, that sounds like a fantastic program. It, it, I've not seen this type of bench scenario before? Is this something new that SACOG is doing or have I just not seen previous programs where this approach was taken? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. So the Civic Lab year two um, and I think <clears throat> even some other mobility related projects have had a, we've established the bench, um, but I think this one is a little bit different. This is the first time we're exploring um, being able to cut out the middleman. The bench has been in place where jurisdictions can pick a vendor, a pre-qualified vendor from our bench to just help with their procurement process. Um, but this is the first time we're actually looking at how do we set this up that 
they can pick from the bench and also just have SACOG pay the vendor directly for the work on behalf of the jurisdiction. That, that sounds great. I'll open it up to other directors. Does anybody have any questions on the re framework? Director New. You're muted, Director New. Thank you. Uh, this question for Jennifer about uh, the funds paying for um, the consultants. As what I didn't quite understand is it, if it is going to happen or if you're working on trying to make it happen. Because I know it's the first thing that my staff always asks me, well, where do you think we're going to get funds to do this? And so is this something that is happening or is it just something that we're working on trying to make it happen? Yeah, the, the funds dedicated to each jurisdiction is something that is happening. So I can definitely follow up with you and tell you how much money has been allocated to winters. Um, that was part of the June action of the board. And then what we're trying to do is set up this bench in a way to make it easy. And so you can use that funds to hire consultants and, and pay your consultants. The part that I'm not speaking super confidently about is that we'll be able to work out a way to let you have access to that bench and have us um, directly have um, pay the consultant with your funding basically. So that part's still working out, but the funding is definitely allocated to each jurisdiction. We'll just want um, a letter from you sometime next year or the beginning part of next year, we'll be soliciting you for a letter of how you plan to spend that funding, but it's definitely already allocated. Thank you very much, that's good news. Yeah. Oh, and I guess I should say, I mean, we had to apply to HCD for the funds as well. They 6.7 million is allocated to SACOG, but we have to apply for them. So we are um, expecting to hear from them in about a month that our application process is approved and then we'll be able to act on the what we talked about today and getting those funds out to you. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Jennifer on this item? All righty, Jennifer, thank you. We can go take a rest now. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you. And let's go ahead and jump to what I think is our last item for the afternoon, which is an update on the Sacramento Regional Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan. Um, that is Victoria. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, my name is Victoria Cacciatore, and I'm here to update on the Parks and Trails Outreach component, what we're working with Caltrans to do to adapt our planned outreach for the Sacramento Region Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan. Uh, a reminder of what the plan itself is, is we are setting out to identify our region's unifying vision for making trail connections and to identify what is standing in the way of us getting there as a region. Back in September, I shared an update on what we heard from our local partners about the opportunities and challenges that are facing each city and county and special district in our region when they're looking to make trail connections and increase access to open space. And today I'm requesting your input on the organizations that would provide insight into the needs of residents of disadvantaged communities as part of our revised approach to outreach in the project. So we do know that trail connections are a way to help us as a region achieve our greenhouse gas reduction goals. And we know that uh, we are able to use these to increase safe active transportation connections and to reduce car trips. We can look at trails and trail networks as a way to support the economy through that access to destinations, but also through creating economic opportunities and designing a more inclusive economy, perhaps when we look at who has or has not access to our trail networks. And lastly, we know that our trail network can be a way that we can strengthen our communities and help create a sense of place and all the while improving mental and physical health of our residents. And for all these benefits that we know, we also know that fewer than half of the residents in their region are near a trail of any length. 
fewer than half of the employment centers or uh, employment opportunities are near a trail of any length. And that lower income families are 30% less likely to have a trail near them. So this is uh, leaving the majority of our region and even more of the lower income residents forced to use either uncomfortable or unsafe travel options if they wish to bike or walk places. So our project had originally planned to conduct on the ground outreach to residents and disinvested communities to learn more about the priority destinations from a resident perspective. Because while we are focused on how we can use trails to increase access to open space in the region, we also acknowledge that there's a great potential for people to use this for more day-to-day -day trips, such as a, if there is a specific grocery store you needed to get to or some sort of service option in the next town over or maybe even the community in which you live. Uh, however, our plan to do outreach at community events was somewhat upended by the pandemic and the lack of sanctioned larger community events at which we could go and expect to find a lot of people who are just there to enjoy their community uh, as opposed to uh, making the conscious decision to go to a public workshop about a trails plan, which uh, very few people uh, are compelled to do. So we are working with Caltrans to revise our outreach approach to conduct more in-depth outreach with community-based organizations that serve disinvested communities. And we hope to use those interviews to learn more about what the residents, those CBOs, uh, the, the residents that the CBOs work with are facing, uh, what those residents are facing just uh, amidst the pandemic, but also with the normal biking and walking challenges or just destinations that they really would like to get to, but maybe cannot. And hopefully that we can gather some information about how to best tee up a broader outreach that we're doing at the beginning of the next year, where even though for this next phase, we're looking to focus on a, what is often called a grass tops outreach process instead of working directly with uh, residents in the community, which we would call grassroots. We're working with the people who work with the people in communities. Uh, we are hoping to do a larger outreach process either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And all of this is focused on the, the destinations that we can look at. So we've shared this list of groups, both with the Transportation Committee earlier today, and then also with the city and county staff and the community-based organizations that we've already been working with on the Parks and Trails plan. And we've been inviting people to suggest additional groups that you feel might be helpful to provide more of this perspective of what community level travel needs uh, and desirable destinations are and very importantly why people want to get there because that will help us feed into what are the things that makes this trail network important to our region and thus uh, worth advancing uh, on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Uh, we've also extended an invite, excuse me, uh, we've also extended an invite to uh, all of the city and county staff to where if we are conducting an interview with an organization that works within your jurisdictional boundaries, you're invited to participate in the interview with us. So it's not that we as SACOG are coming in or, you know, parachuting into the neighborhood and talking with them without any connection to the city and county staff that work with them on a more regular basis or would like to work with them on a more regular basis. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up. Excuse me. 
my apologies. Uh, I'd like to open it up for any comments or recommendations you have of different groups that you think would provide a helpful perspective. Thank you, Victoria. We'll go ahead and open it up to directors. Does anybody have suggestions? Director Frost, I saw first, and then Director Kennedy. Sue? Yes. Uh, I think, um, so the conversations that that they'll be having is, is basically to inform you of uh, ideas on um, how to best make how to best plan and how to um, communicate that with the community basically am I understanding that correctly Victoria I uh, yes I think that's a, a good summarization of it where we're hoping to set up the outreach that will take place later this year for the most success possible given that these will very likely be groups that SACOG specifically has not worked with before, but more are looking to uh, work with our cities and counties in partnership to help build up these relationships and gather uh, information about priority destinations for residents that may not always participate in many of the, uh, the past processes I just wanted to add, there are a couple areas in my district that uh, it's a little different, um, but I guess like between Cit Citrus Heights and the American River Parkway, you know, there there's some wonderful bike biking opportunities by um, bike paths but there's a few disconnects and those connect those potential future connections could not only connect commercial um, centers, but it could also connect people who live a mile or two from the American River Parkway to have a safe travel to the Parkway bike trail. And so I'm thinking um, and it and the and the conversation around that um, I'm thinking of two areas, Orangevale where between Citrus Heights and the American River Parkway and also Rio Linda where there's a discount, the, the bike trail stops and then it kind of goes up and it goes through Placer County and then it comes back through Citrus Heights. Um, and that's the completion of the 60 mile around the whole region, which could be so exciting. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, Chamber of Commerce might um, have a, might be a, some good people to include in that just to have, and there's, there are people in those outlying areas that are coming to my, well, they were coming to my community meetings before COVID that were saying, Sue, do you think if we did a petition you know, we could get uh, them to continue our bike trail, you know, and finish it, you know, um, where it stops at Dry Creek. So um, that's a couple thoughts that are coming from my side of the county. Thank you, Director Frost. Director Kennedy. Yes, thank you, Chair. A um, couple things. First of all, this is great. Uh, I've had constituents clamoring for greater connectivity. Right now we've got a lot of disjointed trails that have been put in and there's gaps and, and there are quite a few people actually down even as far as the vineyard area who have approached me and really would like to commute all the way downtown uh, on bicycle. So um, this is great. Uh, so I do have ideas of how to get community engagement. I don't think that'll be difficult. The question is this is, are you looking for you know, large meetings, they're all virtual, obviously. Um, are, are you, you know, what, what exactly are you looking for so that I can provide you with the right information? What we're looking at right now is instead of 
going to community events and trying to uh, cast a wide net of people it, uh, and meeting them in their neighborhoods. Instead, we would be doing a, a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews with community-based organizations. And uh, I should add that we are not going to be able to contact everybody who's on this list. We'd probably do closer to 10 of these in-depth interviews to learn more about what these groups that work with residents hear from people about uh, the places that they would like to go or where they do need to go if they have trouble even getting to, uh, to different uh, events or services provided by those agencies. Uh, and as we're doing that, we're also trying to get a sense of whether we will be able to hear from any residents that work with the, or that receive uh, either services from those CBOs or work with them, and whether we can partner with those CBOs to spread information to a broader audience that we might be able to get with uh, other partnerships that we would be working on, say, if we were to uh, make a partnership with a media organization. Each media organization has a specific audience and it even like, if you have the, the largest media entity in the region, it still has like not a, a six county all encompassing footprint. So we are looking at almost two tiers of this where one is uh, are there people or groups that you think would be really good for those one-on-one -on -one interviews that would help us reach the difficult to get a hold of residents in the area? And then also people that you might want to be looped into our broader outreach, which is also going to focus on the, the priority destinations within our region, building on what we had learned from our analysis of local plans uh, last summer where we saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in people accessing the, the rivers of our region, uh, various bodies of water. Everybody really likes the bodies of water here. And then uh, a couple of other different uh, destination types. So we're looking to get a little bit more specific with that. And to, I, I think in some ways, uh, verify what we've seen in the local plans as the aspirational goals, and then also to see if there's anything else that maybe would add value in a bit, uh, like a bit more of the regional context to how we identify these regional connections that could be made by trails. And are, are you, I, I would assume that you are already dealing with and talking with uh, the development teams along the Jackson Highway corridor um, where there's 30 to 50,000 homes planned and has a really robust uh, plan for a, a network of trails. I assume you're already talking with them. We've been working with Sacramento County staff and have had some conversations with uh, the people on, on the, the transportation infrastructure side, though not specifically with developers specifically on there. Uh, with all of these, we have been largely relying on the, the city and county staff to identify which information they felt was most important to, to have folded into this. So we can revisit that uh, specific to that corridor. Thank you. Anybody else? Director Noon. Uh, Victoria, I, I think that uh, you said for our jurisdiction, so if you're looking at winter specifically, um, and, and you may want to get, get questions to our staff, but um, the Winter Senior Citizens Commission, I think is a uh, group that needs to be connect, uh, contacted and also the uh, Hispanic Advisory Committee are two groups that uh, I think would be very interested in in ways of getting around. So if you could add those to your list and, and maybe um, if you're not connecting with them directly, make sure that the questions you have get to our, our um, city, city office. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director New. Um, Victoria, I've got just a couple of other thoughts for you. And in, in looking at the list, um, I, I'd say a wide range of organizations, but what, I, what I'm not seeing is any, um, any groups that appear to me to be um, related to education in our communities. And, and I would think that from a quality of life and a recreation standpoint, from a getting kids um, to and from schools on trails instead of on roads might be uh, something to look at. Um, I'm not sure if there's a coalition of districts that focus on um, trails and connectivity in that regard, but um, I, I just, I noticed that I didn't seem to see, see anything related to students of any sort, um, kids getting to and from schools, kids getting out and recreating on trails, that sort of thing. Um, the, the other observation I had in looking at the list was there, there are quite a few, certainly up in Placer County, there are quite a few regional draws from an outdoor recreation standpoint, uh, like the Auburn State Recreation Area, for example. Um, we get people coming from all over, all over, um, to recreate in the canyon. And if we could get those folks riding their bikes up to do that recreation, that would be fantastic. Right now, we end up with our our streets around these trailheads and around these um, uh, river areas that people like to come down and recreate at, packed and packed and packed with cars. In fact. Last summer, we had to shut, shut parking down due to the COVID and, and inadequate spacing folks were having walking up and down, you know, these narrow pathways to get to get down to the river, to get to the trailheads, to, to do that sort of thing. Um, so, again, I'm not sure if, if um, coordinating with the state for the Auburn State Recreation Area is is worth it. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a difficult organization and there's only a few folks that, that are kind of in charge of that whole giant area, but there's certainly a lot of draw there from a destination standpoint. Um, um, the, the, the other thing that I noticed, and, and I think you touched on it, so maybe you've got it handled in a different fashion, but many of our communities have, have trail committees that, that are working on their kind of you know, their city master plan or county master plan. Um, it, it, are those folks kind of baked into what you've already done with, with staff at the staff level? Uh, kind of. What we've been doing is uh, not trying to reinvent the wheel and knowing that we are working with the staff that we work with and that uh, each of those staff from different cities or counties works with a number of committees. So what we've usually done is asked them, er, asked our contacts at cities and counties to share information from this plan with their trail committees or with their active transportation committees. So that way it's coming from a known source as in case, uh, you know, people are asking, why is Victoria Cacciatore emailing me? What is this? Uh, but it allows them to learn about the project from somebody that they already know and in a, a way that makes sense. And then people have the option to, uh, you know, follow our activities directly by signing up for the email list or uh, registering for webinars that we hold, et cetera. Okay, thank, thank you. Um... I guess the one last organization that um, might be good to, to, to be looped into these conversations is, not, I'm not sure I even know what the formal name of them are, but I'm sure they must exist, but the, the American River Bikeway organization of some sort, I, again, I don't know their official name, but I know that that is a, a truly a, a, you know, a regional gem in our area. And, uh, growing up as a kid who would ride on that two, three times a day, um, they might be interested in how their facility interacts with some of the other regional connection 
ideas. Thank you very much, Victoria. I'll ask one more, uh, Director New. Um, Matt, what you were talking about reminded me of another group that I think could be contacted and should be, and that's the Davis Group, Davis Bike Club. They have about 500, active, 500 members. I'm not sure they're all active, but they have many members and it encompasses people in Davis, Sacramento, Woodland, Winters, and beyond. So I think that if uh, you're reaching out, that would be a group that could uh, be contacted also. And if you need somebody to contact, I could get a name or um, contact for you. I thank you for all of these great suggestions that we will add into uh, our list as we work with local agency staff to figure out where where our effort is most needed and where it can best supplement the local efforts, planning efforts and other projects that are in the works. Uh, so they, these can come together well. All right, Victoria, thank you very much again for, for the update, we do appreciate it. Uh, we have two receive and file items. Um, please take a look at those. Those are often kind of snuck snuck in at the end, but there's all kinds of good information in, in those receive and file items. Uh, let's see, other matters? Um, maybe I'll look to James. Do you have any brief announcements you want to make um, to the committee? We thought maybe y'all needed a bit of positive good news this week. So uh, our sustainable community strategy, our, our plan to get to a 19% greenhouse gas reduction has been approved by the Air Resources Board. Uh, we just got that at the end of last week, what that, and if you remember, it's been almost a year since you adopted your MTPSES, but a lot of work goes in after the fact, a lot of staff work, preparing, documentation, and then we were waiting, honestly, with bated breath, I put this in some of my updates to the board, to get that approval, A, to get the approval, and B, to get it right before the SB1 competitive statewide transportation grants are going to be decided. So with that, with that approval, we are now, we continue to be in the running um, for two pretty big programs, the Trade Quarters Program and the Congested Quarters Program, which are huge regional efforts, um, and we should actually find out next week. Number one, in terms of those state grants, and secondly, uh, we, I think, are the region that uses the CEQA streamlining benefits with an SCS more than any other region. So we've got a number of developers and projects that are actually have been waiting for this SCS approval. And now that we have it, um, those folks can use some of the streamlining benefits. Uh, there's a 70 page report that goes along with that, um, that approval from the Air Resources Board. Uh, we may well share that with you and even put some time on the November board agenda to walk through it because uh, believe it or not, we're gonna start our next MTP SCS really soon. And we need to understand where the Air Resources Board is on this. So anyway, good, good news. A ton of work from your staff here. A lot of technical work, a lot of back and forth with the state. Uh, but we've just got that and secured that approval. Great. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up here this afternoon. Staff, thank you very much for the presentations and all of the good efforts there. Really do appreciate that. Uh, for the committee, our next meeting is going to be December 3rd at 1.30. Um, it says in the SACOG boardroom, but I'm guessing we're probably going to stay virtual um, for that meeting as well. With that, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good to see everybody.